we are back guys we are back we are doing a drawing stream before we are chaining that with a lecture about the monomyth and the hero's journey by joseph campbell and then we are going to be back streaming drawing probably hope you are doing well Without further waiting, let's start directly onto the subject. Welcome back. Wow. Today is a subject that I love. It's about the hero's journey. That's why I'm putting journeys soundtrack in the background. This is a bit of a lecture. I'm going to read some article. Most of them are from Wikipedia, so you can reread the, re them. But we're going to explain that further. So let's have a bit of reading about the hero's journey. We are following the previous presentation we had uh, this week about the different character archetypes. Because at some point we talked about the hero, the journey he goes through and stuff like that. So it's important to now talk about the hero's journey. Uh, because this is the trope that everything, everything else is based on. And you will see that the hero's journey is a story structure. Is, it's a narrative structure that you can see in every huge myth, legend, story that has some kind of universal reach. You can think about religious book. You can think about Greek mythology, best-selling books like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, um, stuff like that. You can think about a lot of movie, pretty much every great movie, Batman, uh, Lion King. Give me a sec. Sorry, I got a message on Skype. <clears throat> yeah, basically it's in every kind of great story, great myth. It's the foundation of writing. I would like to say that it's kind of hard to write something different than that and still come up with a good story. You're going to see why it's so important and how it's applied in movies, video game, and stuff like that. It's not that much about character design or something you can apply in the design of your pictures and stuff like that. This is more of a writing stuff, but it's very important as artists to be aware of that. Again, because a lot of us, we have some personal projects, and this is a very, very good structure. Make sure that our story is good and has some kind of universe of which. So let's start. The hero's journey in narratology and comparative mythology is also called the monomyth. It's the common template of story that involves a hero who goes on an adventure, is victorious in a decisive crisis, and comes home changed and transformed. You can have earlier figures that have been proposed and proposing similar concepts, including psychologic Otto Rank, the amateur anthropologist, uh, Lord Ralagan, who discussed hero's narrative pattern in terms of Freudian psychoanalysis and ritualism. But eventually, hero myth pattern studies have been popularized by Joseph Campbell was influenced by Carl Jung. Again, Carl Jung. Campbell used the modern myth to deconstruct and compare religions and mythological stories. In his famous book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, you can get it. It's a must have for artists, in my opinion. It's from 1949. He described the narrative patterns as follows A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. 
The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Coming back with a power, a knowledge to bestow boons on people. You have all the archetypes. You have the magician with the secrets. You have the warrior to be successful in a victory. And you also have granting knowledge and blessing other people. This is the archetype of the king. That's where you see that it's building on top of what we saw on the previous days. So... Campbell describes 17 stages of the monomyth. Not all the monomyths necessarily contain all 17 stages explicitly. Some myths may focus on only one of the stages, while others may deal with the stages in a somewhat different order. In the terminology of Claude Lévi-Strauss, French guy, the stages are the individual myth Mithims, that's a strange word, which are bundled or assemblers to, structure, to be the structure of the monomyth. Basically, you can organize those 17 stages in a number of ways, but it's generally always some kind of free act story. The first one is called the departure, the second one is called the in initiation or the descent, and the next one is the return. In the departure, Part of the narrative, the hero or protagonist lives in the ordinary world and receives a call to go on an adventure. The hero is reluctant to follow the call but is helped by a mentor figure. Just with that, tell me the first story that you are thinking about that. I'm going to re-read this again while you are writing. In the departure part of the narrative, the hero or protagonist lives in the ordinary world and receives a call to go on an adventure. The hero is reluctant to follow the call, but is helped by a mentor figure. Give me some example. Lord of the Rings. I was thinking about Bilbo. It's exactly that. He's living in the Shire. He's fine. He receives a call to go on the adventure with the dwarves. Bilbo is reluctant, but is helped by Gandalf. The mental figure. Descent. Now, the initiation section begins with the hero then traversing the threshold to an unknown or special world, where he faces tasks or trials, either alone or with the assistance of helpers. The hero eventually reaches the innermost cave or the central crisis of his adventure, where he must undergo the ordeal where he overcomes the main obstacle or enemy, undergoing apotheosis and gaining his reward. Following the Hobbit, the innermost cave is literally Gollum's cave. The crisis is stealing the ring. This is the ordeal. The ordeal is the riddle uh, contest with Gollum. And then stealing the ring. And then the apotheosis is when he escapes. And finally grabs the ring. Is gaining the reward. A treasure or elixir. When you think about elixir. I'm thinking about the elixir by Nicola Flamel. That can grant you eternal life. That's exactly the ring. That grants longevity. To the owner of the ring. The hero must then return to the ordinary world. With his reward. He may be pursued by the guardians. Of the special world. Or may be reluctant to return and may be risk rescued, rescued or forced to return by intervention from the outside. Bilbo comes back to the Shire with the ring. He's pursued by Gollum and then the Nazgul wants the ring back. And boom, you are in a new monomyth. In the return section, the hero again traverses the threshold between the worlds, returning to the ordinary world with the treasure or elixir he gained which he may no use for the benefit of his fellow man. The hero himself is transformed by the adventure and gains wisdom and or spiritual power over both worlds. That's exactly Bilbo is an ordinary hobbit and then he's starting to write stories like a hero in the Shire 
It's the richest Hobbit in the entire Shire, by the way. So, let's have a look at the structure. The first act, the departure. According to Campbell, there is one, the call to adventure. Two, refusal of the call. Three, supernatural aid. Four, crossing of the first threshold. Five, belly of the whale. In the initiation, first, the road of trials. Second, the meeting with the goddess. Uh, third, temptation. Nine, atonement with the father. Ten, apotheosis. And six, the ultimate boon. And the return stage. One, refusal of the return. Two, the magic flight. The magic flight. Three, rescue from without. Four, the crossing of the return threshold. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, master of the two worlds. And six, freedom to leave. Hey, you also have Harry Potter, of course. So, let's talk about the different stages. First one, the call to adventure. The hero begins in a situation of normality from which some information is received that acts as a call to head off into the unknown. According to Campbell, this region is represented by a distant land, a forest, a kingdom underground, beneath the waves or above the sky, a secret island, lofty mountaintop, or profound dreamer state. It is always a place of strangely fluid and polymorphous beings, unimaginable torments, superhuman deeds, and impossible delight. The hero can go forth of their own volition to accomplish the adventure, as this Theseus, when he arrived in this father's city, Athens, and heard that horrible story about the Minotaur, or they may be carried or sent abroad by some being or malign intelligence, as was Odysseus, driven about the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean, <coughs> this is so hard to pronounce, the Mediterranean, by winds of an angered god, Poseidon. The adventure may begin as a mere blunder, or still, again, one may only casually strolling when some passing phenomenon catches the wandering eyes and lures one away from the frequented path of man. Second stage, refusal of the call. Often, when the call is given, the future hero first refuses to heed it. He's still in the childhood, the childhood stage. He's still in the immature hero form. This may be from a sense of duty or obligation or fear, insecurity, a sense of inadequacy. Hi, people. Hi, Harry Potter or any of a range of reasons that work to hold the person in his current circumstances. Campbell says that refusal of the summons converts the adventure into its negative. While in boredom, hard work, or culture, the subject loses the power of significant affirmation action and becomes a victim to be saved. This flowering world becomes a wasteland of dry stones and his life feels meaningless, even though, lacking minus, he may, through titanic efforts, succeed in building an empire of renown. Whatever house he builds, it will be a house of death, a labyrinth of cyclopean walls to hide from him his minotaur. All he can do is create new problems for himself and await the gradual approach of his disintegration. Remember that first scene in Harry Potter with all the letters and the Dursley are becoming even crazier. The more there are some letters, the more the, the, the stronger the call to adventure for Harry Potter, the stronger they are trying to gaslight Harry. Like, no, you're not a wizard. You will never go to Hogwarts. They're getting crazy. Like, that's enough. We're going to go far away where they won't be able to find us. I love that scene. I remember that scene when I was a kid when I watched it for the first time. When you see all the owls. 
all the owls and the, the letters are raining is trying to grab them oh my god you, you, yeah i don't know this is so great when you are a kid you watch that you're like i want that to happen to me <laughs> then there is a supernatural aid this is the third stage once the hero has committed to the quest, consciously or unconsciously, his guide and magical helper appears or become known. More often than not, this supernatural mentor will present the hero with one or more talismans or artifacts that will aid him later in his quest. Campbell writes, What such a figure represents is B9, protecting power of destiny. The fantasy is a reassurance promise that the peace of paradise, which was known first within the mother's womb, is not to be lost. That this supports the present and stands in the future as well as in the past. That is, Omega as well as Alpha, basically. That through omnipotence may seem to be endangered by the threshold passage and life awakenings. Protective power is always and ever present within or just behind the unfamiliar features of the world. One has only to know and trust, and the edgeless, edgeless guardian will appear, having responded to his own call and continuing to follow courageously as the consequences unfold. The hero finds all the forces of the unconscious at his side. Mother nature herself supports the mighty task, as in so far the hero's act coincides with that for which his society itself is ready. He seems to ride on the great rhythm of the historical process. I know this is quite a very literate reading. This is a quotation from Campbell. So he was writing in a very uh, classical way. So bear with me. It's pretty hard also for me as a French person to read that. But bear with me. It's very long. But basically, there's the talisman that will help you to get protected in that new unknown magical world. Maybe the ring, it can be the one for, the one for Harry, stuff like that. We're going to see the example. We're going to run many stories through all of those stages. Then crossing of the first threshold. This is the point where the hero actually crosses into the field of adventure, leaving the known limits of his world and venturing to an unknown and dangerous realm where the rules and limits are unknown. Campbell tells us about that. With the personifications of his destiny to guide and aid him, the hero goes forward in his adventure until he comes to the threshold guardian. At the entrance of the zone of magnified power, such custodians, bound to the world in four directions, also up and down, standing for the limit of the hero's prison sphere of life horizon. This is very complex. Beyond them is darkness, the unknown, a danger, just as beyond the parental watch is a danger to the infant and beyond the protection of his society, danger to the members of the tribe. The usual person is more than content, he is even proud to remain within the indicated bounds, and popular group beliefs gives him every reason to fear so much as the first step into the unexplored. That's basically it needs courage to go outside of the um, of the mold. That's exactly what you see with the Dursley. Like, no, you are not a wizard and stuff like that. It takes courage to admit that. The adventure is always and everywhere a passage beyond the veil of the known to the unknown. The power that watch at the boundary are dangerous. To deal with them is risky. Yet for anyone with competence and courage, the danger of fate. Next stage, the belly of the whale. The belly of the whale represents the final separation from the hero's known world and self. By entering this stage, the person shows a willingness to undergo metamorphosis. When first entering the stage, the hero may encounter a minor danger or setback, according to Campbell. The idea that the passage of the magical thresholds is a transit into a sphere of rebirth. It symbolized in the worldwide womb image of the belly of the whale. The hero, instead of conquering or conciliating the power of the threshold, is swallowed into an unknown and would appear to have died. The 
popular motif gives emphasis to the lesson that the passage of the threshold is a form of self-annihilation. Instead of passing outward beyond the confines of the visible world, the hero goes inward to be born again. The disappearance corresponds to the passing of a worshipper into the temple, where he is to be quickened by the recollection of who and what he is, namely dust and ashes unless immortal. The temple interior, the belly of the whale, and the heavenly land beyond, above and below the confines of the world, are one and the same. This is why the approaches and entrance of temples are flanked and defended by colossal gargoyles. The two rules, the two rows of teeth of the whale, this is the equivalent of the two rows of teeth of the whale. They illustrate the fact that the devotee at that moment of entry to a temple undergoes a metamorphosis. We're going pretty deep. For people doing architecture design, shout out to you, Aesir. Once inside, he may be said to have died to time and returned to the world bomb, the world naval, the earthly paradise. Allegorically, allegorically then the passage into a temple and the hero dive and the hero dive through the jaws of the whales identical adventures, both denoting in picture language the life centering, life renewing act. This is basically when the hero can uh, let his own his old self die, his old conception of what he was, what his life was behind him to accept this new form of life. This is when Harry, for example, accepts the idea that he's a wizard. Then you're going to do through the initiation stage. Just give me a second. Putting a bit more heat in my room. There you go, it's getting a bit cold. So, the first step of the initiation phase is the Road of Trials. The Road of Trials is a series of tests that the hero must undergo to begin transformation. Often the hero fails one or more of these tests, which often occur in freeze. Eventually the hero will overcome these trials and move on to the next step. Campbell explains that once having traversed the threshold, the hero moves in a dream landscape of curiously fluid, ambiguous form where he must survive a succession of trials. This is a favorite phase of the myth adventure. It has produced a world literature of mi miraculous tests and ordeals. The hero is covertly aided by the advice, amulets, and secret agents of the supernatural helper whom he met before his entrance into the region. Basically the mentor. Or it may be that here he discovers for the first time that there is benign power everywhere supporting him in his superhuman passage. The original departure into the land of trials represented only by the beginning of the long and really perilous path of initiatory of initiatory initiatory contests and moments of illumination. Dragons have now to be slain and surprising barriers passed again and again and again. Meanwhile, there will be a multitude of preliminary victories and sustainable ecstasies and momentary glimpses of the wonderful land. This is basically all the adventure part, all the action where all the action happens. Then, meeting with the goddess. This is where the hero gains item given to him that will help him in the future. Campbell proposes that the, the ultimate adventure when all the barriers and ogres have been overcome is commonly represented as a mystical marriage of the triumphant hero solved with the queen goddess of the world. This is the crisis at the nadir, the zenith or at the uttermost edge of the earth at the central point of the cosmos, in the tabernacle of the temple, or in the darkest of the deepest chamber of the heart. The meeting with the goddess, who is incarnate in every woman, is the final test of the talent of the hero to win the boon to love. 
which it's in his life itself enjoyed as the encasement of eternity. This is getting pretty mystical right there, but it's based upon religious book first. So bear with me. And when the adventurer in this context is not a youth, but a maid, she's the one who by her qualities, her beauty, or her yearning, is fit to become the consort of an immortal. Then the heavenly husband descends to her and conducts her to his bed, whether she will or not. And if she has shunned him, the scales fa falls from her eyes. If she has sought him, her desire finds its peace. This is very mystical. But for example, you can see Galadriel. She is the immortal goddess. She has become the embodiment of the goddess herself. And she is now helping the king, Elrond, and the other people. Temptations. In these steps, the he and also about the monomyth. Now you can use that on a universal way, no problem about that. But in classical literature, it was a male hero. That's why he's meeting the goddess. And that's why in temptation, it's generally a female form that is doing the temptation for him. But you can perfectly reverse the trope, no problem. As it mentioned, you see what's possible with other archetypes. In these steps, the hero faces those temptations, often a physical or pleasurable nature that may lead him to abandon or stray from his quest, which does not necessarily have to be represented by a woman. A woman is a metaphor for the physical or material temptation of life, since the hero knight was often tempted by lust from his spiritual journey. See, that's exactly that. It's not to put everyone in a case, it's just to have a metaphorical language. Campbell relates that the crux of the curious difficulty lies in the fact that our conscious views of what life ought to be seldom correspond to what life is really is. Generally, we refuse to admit within yourself or within our friends the fullness of that pushing, self-protective, malodorous, carnivorous, lecherous fever, which is the very nature of the organic cell. Rather, we tend to perfume, whitewash, and reinterpret. Meanwhile, imagining that all the flies in the ointment, all the hairs in the soups, are the faults of some unpleasant someone else, are the faults of someone unpleasant else, of some unpleasant someone else. Sorry, it's very hard to read. But when it suddenly downs us or is forced to our attention that everything we think or do is necessarily tainted with the odor of the flesh. And not commonly, there is experienced a moment of revolution. Life, the act of life, the organs of life, the woman in particular, as the great symbol of life, become intolerable to the pure, to the pure, pure soul. The seeker of the life, beyond life, must press beyond the woman, surpass the temptation of her call, and soar to the immaculate under beyond. Again, don't crucify me. This is classical literature. You can reverse the trope without any issue or reverse whatever you want. This is metaphorical stuff. Bear with me, please. Don't crucify me. Next, atonement with the father. In this step, the hero must confront and be initiated by whatever holds the ultimate power in his life. In many myths and stories, this is the father or father figure who has life and death power. This is the center point of the journey. All the previous death have been moving into this place and that follow will move out from it. Although this step is most frequently symbolized by an encounter with a male entity, it does not have to be a male. Just someone or something with incredible power. It's not talking about love, it's talking about lust, in general, or any kind of temptation, but it says at the beginning it does not have to be lust. But lust is the most common example. For example, in the Bible, you have Lilith doing the temptation for, I for Adam. And of course, Lilith was temp tempting Adam with lust. It's just that lust is the easiest temptation to represent. It might be gold, it might be power, we're gonna see that. But temptation can have different forms. It might even be safety, like, hey, abandon, come back from where else you came. 
it's better this way. It might be a temptation to come back, just to get back to comfort. It doesn't have to be always love. And basically, temptation, now that we have the lesson about the lover, you know that lust and abusive love is the addicted lover, so it's a dysfunctional one. It's a bait toward a dysfunctional form of love. That's why lust and being too lusty leads the archetype towards the addicted lover. See how it's uh, stick together? This is this way that you need to see that. You do not have to interpret that literally. That's what I want to say when I say don't crucify me. Because I know today... It, 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 because it's putting people in different cases, it might appear as sexist or whatever. That's why I'm saying don't crucify me and you need to read between the lines. Understand that it has some kind of universal and at the time and still a lot today, we're using this classical language you know, to make sure it's understood. <laughs> but yeah, don't crucify me, please. This is just me reading some wikis and trying to explain that as best I can. So yeah, atonement with the father at this step. This is facing either a father figure with life and death power or an incredibly powerful creature. Burke Campbell, atonement consists in no more than the abandonment of that self-generated double monster, the dragon felt to be God, the superhero, and the dragon felt to be seen, repressed. But this requires an abandonment of the attachment to ego itself. And that is what is difficult. One must have faith in that the father is merciful and that a re reliance and then a reliance on that mercy. Therewith, the center of belief is transferred outside of the veiling gods. This is so ancient language. The devealing gods, tight scaly ring. Oh, they're talking about the ring. And the dreadful ogre dissolves. It is in this ordeal that the hero may derive hope and assurance from the helpful fe female figure by whose magic, pollen charms of power of intersection. He is protected through all the frightening experience of the father's ego shattering initiation. For if it is impossible to trust the terrifying father face and was. One's face must be centered elsewhere. This is the archetype of the spider woman of the blessed mother, for example. And with that reliance for support, one endures crisis only to find in the end that the father and mother reflect each other and are in a sense the same. See, I'm not even. I didn't even have to say don't crucify me because even Campbell say are in a sense the same. Whew, I'm saved. Campbell later explains. Hello, Asia, how are you doing? Campbell later expounds. The problem the hero going to meet the father is to open his soul beyond terror to such a degree that he would be ripe to understand how the sickening and insane tragedy of his vast and ruthless cosmos are completely validated in the majesty of being. This is very metaphorical. The hero transcends life with its Peculiar blind spot and for a moment rises to a glimpse of the source. He beholds the face of the father, understands, and the two are atoned. Then there is the stage of apotheosis. This is the point of realization in which a greater understanding is achieved. And with this new knowledge and perception, the hero is resolved and ready for the more difficult part of the adventure. Campbell discloses that those who know not only that the everlasting lies in them, that what they and all things really are is the everlasting. Dwell in the growth of the wish fulfilling tree, drink the brew of immortality, and listen every word to the honored music of eternal concord. This is such a religious language. This is so hard to grasp out of context. But basically, this is when the hero realizes that his first initial fight is not the real one, and there is one that is worth way more. This is basically when the hero is stopping to fight for himself and becomes a warrior 
and he's fighting for something greater than him. This is transformation. Then there is something called the ultimate boon. The ultimate boon is the achievement of the goal of the quest. This is what the hero went on the journey to get. All the previous steps serve to prepare and purify the hero for this step, since in many myths, the boon is something transcendent like the elixir of life itself, a plant that supplies immortality or the holy grail. Campbell confers that the gods and goddess then are to be understood as embodiments and custodians of the elixir of, the elixir of imperishable being, but not themselves the ultimate in its primary state. What the hero seeks through is intercourse with them, is therefore not fairly themselves, but their grace. The blessing of the king and the queen. The power of their sustaining substance. This miraculous energy or substance is this, and this alone is the imperishable. The names and form of the deities who everywhere embody, dispense, and represent it come and go. This is the miraculous energy of the thunderbolts of Zeus, Yahweh, and the Supreme Buddha, the fertility of the reign of Viracocha, the virtue announced by the bell rung by the mass at the consecration, and the light of the ultimate illumination of the saint and sage. Its guardians there release it only to the duly proven. This is basically when you, you get the quest item. Then there is the return phase. First, there is generally the refusal of the return. Having found bliss and enlightenment in the other world, the hero may not want to return to the ordinary world to bestow the boon upon his fellow man. Campbell, Campbell continues. When the hero quest has been accomplished, through penetration of the source, or through the grace of some male or female, human or animal personification, the adventurer still must return to his life, transmuting trophy. The, the full round, the norm of the monomyth, requires that the hero shall now begin the labor of bringing the runes of wisdom, the golden fleece, or his sleeping princess, back to the kingdom of humanity, where the boon may re redound to the renewing of the community, the nation, the planet, or the 10,000 worlds. But the responsibility has been frequently refused. Even Gautama Buddha, after his triumph, doubted whether the message of realization could be communicated, and since saints are reported to have died while in the supernatural ecstasy. Numerous indeed as the heroes fabled to have taken up residence forever in the blessed island of the unaging goddess of immortal being. Again, this is some kind of temptation right there. Then there is the magic flight. Sometimes the hero must escape with the boon if it is something that gods have been jealously guarding. Prometheus stealing the fire, for example. It can be just as adventurous and dangerous returning from the journey as it was to go on. Campbell reveals that if the hero in his triumphs wins the blessing of the goddess, or the god, and is then explicitly commissioned to return to the world with some elixirs for the restoration of society, the final stage of his adventure is supported by all the powers in his supernatural patron. On the other hand, if the trophy has been attained against the opposition of its guardians, or if the hero's wish to return to the world has been resented by the gods of demons, then the last stage of the mythological round becomes a lively, often comical pursuit. This flight may be complicated by marvels of magical destruction and evasion. What about the volcano exploding at the end of the Lord of the Rings? Trapping Frodo and Sam. And then Gandalf coming with the birds. Trapping. Then. There's something called Rescue from Without. And this is exactly Gandalf. 
Just as the hero may need guides and assistance to set out on the quest, often he must have powerful guides and rescuers to bring them back to everyday life. Especially if the person has been wounded or weakened by the expense high Frodo. Campbell elucidates. The hero may have to be brought back from his supernatural adventure by assistance from without. That is to say, the world may have to come and get him. For the bliss of the deep above is not lightly abandoned in favor of the self-scattering of the weakened state. We have cast of the world. We read... Uh, your desire to return again, blah, 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 blah. If the hero is unwilling, the disturber suffers an ugly shock. But on the other hand, if the summoned one is only delayed, sealed by the beatitude of state of a perfect being which resembles death, an apparent rescue is effected and the adventurer returns. This is exactly Gandalf with the birds. Then, there's the crossing of the return threshold. Campbell says in The Hero with a Thousand Face that the returning hero to complete his adventure must survive the impact of the world. The trick is returning to it to it. the trick in returning is to return the wisdom gained on the quest, to integrate that wisdom into human life and then maybe figure out how to share the wisdom with the rest of the world. Earlier in the book, Campbell says, Many failures attest to the difficulties of this life, affirmative threshold. The first problem of the returning hero is to accept as real, after an experience of the soul satisfaction, vision of fulfillment, the passing joys and sorrows, banalities, and noisy obscenities of life. Why we enter such a world? Why attempt to make plausible or even interesting to people consumed with passion the experience of transcendental bliss? As dreams that were momentous by night may seem simply silly in the light of the day so the poet and the prophet can discover themselves playing the idiot before a jury of sober eyes. The easy thing to commit the easy thing is to commit the whole community to the devil and retire again in the heavenly rock dwelling, close the door, and make it fast. But if some spiritual obstetrician has drawn um, she may not wear across the retreat, then the work of presenting eternity in time and perceiving in it <coughs> across the retreat, then the work of representing eternity in time and perceiving in time eternity cannot be avoided. Oh, this is heavy writing. But basically, this is when you accept that the adventure is over and you are back to the regular normal. Master of the two worlds. For human hero, it may mean achieving a balance between the material and spiritual. The person has become comfortable and competent in both the inner and outer world. Campbell demonstrates that. Freedom to pass back and forth across the world division from the perspective of the apparition of time to that of the causal deep and black, thus contaminating the principle of the one with those of the other, yet permitting the mind to know the one by virtue of the other, is the talent of the master. The cosmic dancer, the class Nietzsche, does not rest heavily in a single spot, but gaily, unlikely, turns and leaps from one position to another. It is possible to speak from only one point at a time, but that does not invalidate the insights of the rest. The individual, through prolonged psychological disciplines, gives up completely all attachment to his personal limitations, hopes and fears, no longer resists the self-annihilating that is a prerequisite to rebirth in the realization of truth and so becomes ripe, at last, for the great at one moment, his personal ambitions being totally dissolved, he no longer tries to live, but willingly relaxes to whatever may come to pass in him. It becomes, that is to say, anonymity. It's again getting back to normal. And there is a step called freedom to live. And this is the last one. In this step, 
Mastery leads to freedom from the fear of death, which in turn is the freedom to live. This is sometimes referred as to living in the moment, neither anticipating the future nor regretting the past. Campbell declares the hero is the champion of things becoming, not of the things become, because he is. Before Abraham was, I am. He does not mistake apparent changelessness in time, the permanence of the being, nor is fearful of the next moment or of the other thing as destroying the permanent with his change. There is Ovid in the Metamorphosis who says nothing retains its own form but nature the greater renewer ever makes up forms from forms. Be sure that nothing perishes in the world universe, it does but vary and renew its forms. Thus, the next moment is permitted to come to pass. This is basically when the hero becomes a nobody and returns to normal and leaves. This is basically the... Um, they, they got plenty of kids and lived happily ever after. Whew! I know there was some pretty heavy writing. It was pretty hard to read. Let's explain all of that. There is a con uh, another writer contemporary to uh, Campbell called Christopher Vogler who summarized that in different steps. He made, he made it a bit simpler. The first stage is ordinary wall, then call to adventure, then refusal of the call, then meeting with the mentor, then crossing the first threshold. This is the pack of the call to adventure. And there is the test, allies and enemies, approach to the inmost cave, the ordeal, reward, the road back, resurrection, and return with the elixir. And I'm pretty sure while listening to that, you might have thought about a lot of different stories. So if you want, let's run a lot of different uh classic stories that we all know through the different steps would that apply to modernity of course we're gonna see that with modern myths and if you want we can start with something modern we can start with the lion king if you want i was confusing there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff I advise you to read the to read the wikipedia again there is a nice graph i'm gonna share my screen if you want actually let me zoom on that. As you see, there is a big graph explaining the different steps, and then there is the definition. But we're going to explain all of that if you want. So let's pick the Lion King if you want. Call to Adventure. In the Lion King, we're following Simba, he's the hero, and stuff like that. Call to Adventure. This is basically the moment when um, Ufasa is telling him, Hey, you're going to basically uh, become a king. There's a lot of different stuff. Simba is like, yeah, I'm going to become the king and stuff like that. And then for whatever reason, there is... Um, Scar, which basically makes him refuse the call. It's like, no, you won't become a king. You will exclude it from society. And the biggest refusal of the call is like, hey, let's live the Hakuna Matata life. Then supernatural aid. When Simba is meeting uh, Rafiki, this is the mentor, basically. And this is when he's crossing the first threshold. When he's seeing his dad in the sky, like Simba, you abandoned me and stuff like that. This is also the belly of the whale, basically. Belly of the whale, let's get back on it. Final separation from the hero's known world and self. So, before he was thinking, I'm just a lion, I'm leaving the Hakuna Matata. And then there is Mufasa telling him, hey, you are my son, you are the king, you need to save the lands. That's why, for the first time, he's abandoning that. Roads of Trial. This is when he's getting back 
Being tempted to leave or not. He's feeling guilty. Stuff like that. Meeting with the goddess. This is when Lara comes back. Temptation. This is one that is kind of skipped, to be honest. You could argue that the temptation was the Akuna Matata lifestyle. I would say this is that. Atonement with the father. You see, it's not coming in the same order, but we have all the step. Atonement with the father. This is literally when he's facing his, his father in the sky. Apotheosis. That's when he decides, indeed, to come back. Ultimate boon. This is when he's in his mind. Okay, I am the king. I am Mufasa's son. I need to do something. Refusal of the return. This is when he's still guilty of that. He still thinks he has killed Mufasa. Then there is uh, Scar telling him to basically... That basically he killed Mufasa. Then the magic flight, rescue from without and stuff like that. That's not really something that you have in the end. Crossing of the return threshold. This is kind of strange because there is not the return to normal because he abandoned the hero's path and he's becoming a hero again. That's why it starts to derive a bit from that. But if you want, let's pick Harry Potter again. Call to adventure. Harry is living under the stairs and one day he receives a letter telling him he is admitted to Hogwarts. Refusal of the call. He doesn't know he's a wizard. He doesn't believe that and the Dursley are trying to gaslight him into thinking he will stay there forever. Supernatural aid. This is when Hagrid uh, comes and tells him, Indeed, hey, you are a wizard and you are free to read that later the first time in your life. Crossing the first threshold. That's literally the... Uh, the... Um, Diagon Alley. And he's entering through Diagon Alley and finally quitting the normal world to enter the magical world. Belly of the Whale. The final separation from the hero's known world and self. It might be when he's entering the train. And going to Hogwarts and entering Hogwarts for the first time. And I would argue that the belly of the well scene is when the, the hat is discussing with him. And finally telling, okay, you're going to get to Gryffindor. And now he's admitting in the school with everyone cheering and stuff like that. He's finally admitting in this new family. That's what I would argue this is. Meeting with the goddess. And temptation. I would say that's when he's uh, meeting with the mirror and seeing his parents. Atonement with the father. Again, when he's seeing the mirror. You see, you have all three of them in once. Apotheosis. When he realizes that a great, uh, in which a greater understanding is achieved, he realizes that something bigger than himself needs to be fought for. That's when he decided he decides to steal the philosopher's stone. The ultimate boon. This is basically when he's um, going through the different stages in order to retrieve the stone. Refusal of the return. Kind of strange. Um, I might compare that to another road of temptation when Voldemort is telling him, Hey, give me the stone, we can bring your parents back. Come with me. Become a bad guy. And Harry is like, no, uh, but he has a split second of hesitation. Magic flight. We literally have some magic flights in Harry Potter. But if you read the book of the first one, you know that when Harry is unconscious, this is Dumbledore bringing him back. 
was cube from without that's exactly that and that's also the friends helping him and the rescue from without is when voldemort is trying to kill him and his hands are starting to burn the first one the crossing of the return threshold that's when he has to leave hogwarts and get back to the dursleys master of the two world now the dursley are treating him in a very different way because they know he knows how to use magic and freedom to live eventually is able to move back and forth between both worlds. See? I'm pretty sure we can do that for the second Harry Potter and all of them. Second one, Call to Adventure. Let's get back to Hogwarts. And we have a strange murder mystery series. Refusal of the Call. No, this might not be Harry, the hire of uh, Sealed Ring. Supernatural aid. Again, this is Dumbledore. Every time there is a murder, there is Harry nearby. He's hearing some voices and there is Dumbledore like, I trust you. I know that you are a good guy. Crossing the first threshold. That's when he realizes by hearing the um, snake tongue language. What the hell is going on? Am I a bad guy? Am I the 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 hero of Sildarin? Benny of the Whale. That's basically when he's learning about the, um, the, um, the the snake tongue, and he's like, "Oh my God, am I? Am I? Am I? Am I?" World of Trials. That's a different stage that he has during the year, like the the magic duel stuff like that. Making the potion, stuff like that. Meeting with the goddess. There's not that much in this one. Same with temptation, there's not that much. The only temptation there is, however, is with the book when he's reading the journal and get, getting absorbed with the journal. But the temptation is Ginny Weasley with the book. She's completely hooked to the book and she's getting scared with that. It might not be for the hero, but it might be affecting the hero indirectly. Tournament with the father, we don't really have that. But he is facing the big spider that has life and death. Apotheosis, he, re he realizes that there is the basilisk. And we need to do something about the Chamber of Secrets. The ultimate boon. This is when he decides to go to the Chamber of Secrets. Refusal of the return. Again... This can be argued for the end of the year when he gets back. This can also be when basically it's kind of hard for other people to come back from the Chamber of Secrets. Like um, the um, Gildoroy Lockhart trying to trap them in the Chamber of Secrets. Magic Flight. We literally have the Phoenix flying to save Harry. Rescue from without. Again, the phoenix and the sword of Gryffindor. Crossing the return threshold. This one is interesting. That's when he realizes that only a Gryffindor can put up the sword out of the, of the hat. Master of two worlds. He's now a master of both Gryffindor, but also of the snake tongue. Freedom to live. He's dealing with that. Again and again and again. We can, we can have the third one. Let's do the Lord of the Rings. I mean, let's do the Hobbit first. Call to Adventure. Bilbo is leaving the Shire. Pretty, pretty chill. Then, there are the Dwarves and Gandalf coming. Refusal of the Call. Bilbo is like, no, I'm not your guy. Then, Supernatural Aid. Gandalf is convincing him, hey, come. This would be nice. I'm going on an adventure! Yeah! Crossing the frustration. Literally, that scene, uh... That scene, when he's jumping on top of the fence. Uh, fence. This scene. Literally, literally crossing the threshold. Lady of the Whale. 
that's basically when he's uh walking with the dwarves and he's already missing you you see that scene with the napkin and you have a napkin just <laughs> bringing back he's like oh my god i'm not in my my place anymore <laughs> Road of Trials, that's all the different adventures that they have. Meeting with the goddess. <laughs> Temptation. This is why you see it's not always love, it's just he's missing comfort and at some point he's trying to sneak, to escape and to get back to his home. And there's a dwarf, uh, do you really want to come back to come back home? Yeah, go. And he's very tempted. But on his way back he's like, no, I must help them. And then he's coming back. Atonement with the father. This is way, way, way later. It might be while fighting to save Thorin. I would say the atonement with the father is when he's facing Smog. I smell you, To me, this is the atonement with the father. Because when we read the description, Instance. With the abyss. He must confront and be initiated with, by whatever holds the ultimate power in his life. Smog is so cool! He's so cool! This might also be the the riddle with golem what holds the most power over his life this is the ring it's the first time he's seeing the ring and he's immediately attracted by the ring for whatever reason he decide to steal him that's why he's called a thief apotheosis this one is a bit later but this might be also when he's grabbing the ring and he realizes that this ring is precious. Ultimate boon. This is basically when he retrieves the ring or he retrieves the Arkenstone. If he's out of the return. This is not half available. But he fights pretty hard and the refusal of the return is helped. Basically, with the rescue from without, when throwing about to die and saying, come back to your place, grow your tree, chill, stuff like that. The magic flight, we literally have some magic flight in The Hobbit. With the birds. Crossing the return threshold. Getting back to the Shire. Master of Two World is becoming the most famous Hobbit in all time. Telling stories to kids. Is the richest too? Is back with treasure with the mutual chainmail with the ring, and he's the master of two worlds because he's just a hobbit. He has the ring and he has power that no one else has, and freedom to live. This one is fun because the story of Bilbo ends basically when he's quitting the Shire, and if you want to go even deeper than that. Refusal of the return. I will say. You could get back again. To the beginning in the Lord of the Ring. Call to adventure. He leaves the Shire. Refusal of the call. It's pretty hard for him to leave the ring. Supernatural aid. This is Gandalf helping like. Bilbo Baggins. <clears throat> Crossing the first threshold when he's leaving the Shire. Belly of the Whale. And he realizes why seeing Frodo again in um, Rivendell. 
and he's crying he's like oh, oh i'm so sad i gave you that burden kid road of trial he doesn't really have that it's kind of skip but we can feel that he has been tortured mentally by missing the ring meeting with the goddess is meeting with galadriel again temptation and he sees when frodo is uh, untying his shirt to 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 get the meat for you and you see the ring it's that scene Prophesis. and when Bill was crying and like oh, i'm so sorry kid ultimate boon again he's leaving and he's uh letting the the book to to frodo oh plus master of two world Bill was writing book anyway. then uh, refusal of the return Move forward at the end of the Lord of the Rings when Bilbo is very old and they are about to go to the Grey Haven. That scene is incredible. You have Bilbo is like, why is my old ring? I would love to see him once again. And Frodo is like, I'm sorry, I thought I forgot it. I lost it. Magic flight. I would not say a magic flight, but a magic boat towards the Grey Haven. Rescue from without. I would say there is Galadriel, there is Edmund, and you see that scene at the end of the Lord of the Rings. Frodo, once he's back, it's pretty hard for him to return. And only once he's in the, at the grave and he's smiling. He's finally relieved. Crossing of the return threshold. Bilbo is entering the boat. Master of Two World, Freedom to Leave. Master of Two World, we don't know, but it's the end of the life of Bilbo. And Freedom to Leave, the boat leaves and they go to heaven, basically. Lord of the Rings! Call to Adventure. Frodo see Bilbo disappear and Gandalf appear like this is the ring the worn ring forged by Sauron himself in the flames of Mordo has been staying here for 60 years Frodo is like okay let's hide it and uh, never talk about it ever again supernatural aid Gandalf back 20 years later is it safe? You must leave Frodo. Tyrion Bree. The prodding pony. The prod. What's that mean in English? The pony. Oh. What's the translation in English? The prancing pony. Crossing the first threshold. This is that scene with Sam. When Sam is stopping, there's Frodo. What is it? There is this. One more step, and uh, I will be the further I've ever been from the Shire. This is literally crossing the first threshold. Belly of the whale. Final separation when Sam finally accepts to do that additional step and, and, and leave the Shire. The Road of Trial. All the road towards Bree, with the Nazgul hiding, meeting Mary and Pippin and stuff like that. This is the adventure. Meeting with the goddess. <laughs> temptation. There is literally the temptation. Frodo, give me the ring. And Frodo is like, if you ask me, I will give you the ring. This is literally the this is the very classical interpretation of the witch, the witch archetype. For split second, Galadriel is literally the witch archetype, the temptress. Atonement with the father. That's the moment when he is uh facing. There are many of them. The first one is in Driven Dead when he's facing Bilbo, and Bilbo's like Aah! It's to to stand up for himself for the first time. Then when he's uh, putting a button on his shirt to hide the ring because he, he sees that Bilbo is affected by that. That's the moment with the father. Another one is with the Nazguls. And with Sauron when he's putting the ring at um, Weathertop and getting stabbed. This is an atonement with the father. When he's putting the ring for the first time and when he sees Sauron for the first time, that's another attunement. A lot! A frozen story is atonement with the father. The father figure is Sauron. Apotheosis. 
That's basically when you have that great uh, council. The ring must be destroyed. Ultimate boon. That's when the fellowship of the ring is made. Then you have all the story against Rose of Trial. Meeting with the goddess, with Boromi attempted by the ring. Aragon tempted to grab them, but succeeding. Um, so many stuff is circling in that, that stage. Let's move towards the end of the Lord of Rings. Refusal of the return. Frodo and Sam are trapped after having destroyed during their trap by the lava around. Magical flight. Gandalf came. The birds saved him. That's the rescue from without. Crossing the return threshold. Everyone is able to do that, but Frodo is not smiling, so he's still, he's still in the refusal of return. Everyone is starting to live happy again. Sam is getting married. That scene is incredible. Everyone is happy. Pippin is a knight. Mary is a guard of, of Rohan. And he's saving the Shire from uh, Saruman, uh, from the remains of Saruman's army. And uh, but Frodo is still stuck. He's not smiling. His writing is weak. He, he has never fully cured. He's still in refusal of the return. And with Bilbo, it's like Uncle Bilbo. We got a very special gift from the elves. We got the ticket for the last boat towards the Grey Heavens. That's the promise of the magical flight. And, and that's the rescue from without. Thanks to Galadriel and Elrond and Gandalf leaving and allowing them to leave too. Crossing of the return threshold. To me, that's when... Um, that scene, oh my god, you cry. That scene, you, if, you, if you're not crying on that scene, you're not human. I'm, I'm not sorry about that. That's when um, he's saying goodbye to Sam. The Master of Two World is when he's giving the book. The last pages are for you. And Freedom to Leave is that scene just before the boats leave where you see Frodo's face and he's smiling for the first time. There we go. See? That's it. I know it was confused at the beginning, but it probably makes way more sense now. And I want to say something about that very special game called Journey. Journey I'm assuming everyone played Journey. If you have not played Journey, play it or just watch your Let's Play. But Journey... I don't know. There is an interview uh, of the developers reading letters from people who play Journey. It's crazy to see that everyone is seeing something different in it. There's some anecdotes like, hey, I was playing that with my father. He was diagnosed with final stage cancer. And it helped us, both of us, to say goodbye to each other. Wow. And you have some people, myself included, like playing Journey was like, every time I play Journey, it's like having a mirror in front of me and seeing my entire life. It's so abstract and so well written that you, you see what you need to see into it. And uh, what is good is that Journey is based upon the monomy from start to finish. The game starts and there is a falling star crashing in the desert. And this character come out. It's like the birth of a baby. The character is made of clothes. He has very skinny legs, no arms. He has no way to defend himself. 
know themselves or themselves, let's say they. Character has no way to defend themselves. And this is basically the archetype of the hero, as we saw yesterday. Uh, three days ago, sorry. It's a child. It is kind of weak. It shows potential because the character can fly. At the same time, the only thing we want is either to encourage the character or to protect the character. Or both, actually. Then we walk. Almost instantly, there is that incredible zoom with that... I have goosebumps just looking at the picture. You have that, you have the zoom, you have the journey wall, uh, name. And you understand with the composition. Because you are exactly on the same line. Because the shape of the mountain is the same shape as for the character. You know that this is your destination. And that the entire game will be to climb and to go to that light. Oh my god, I love that game so much. This is the first time and one of the only time I have ever cried in front of a video game. If you don't want to see a let's play of Journey or to play Journey with me because I will cry from start to finish. At some point, I think I will uh, talk about Journey uh, and all the symbolics into it. I could, I could talk about it for like two hours. There's so much symbolism into that. Those stones are like tombstones with the cloaks of those who failed, who abandoned, basically. And uh, basically... That's why I put the music of Journey. Can you read the text? Can you read the text properly? Just tell me. Nascence. The call for adventure. First confluence, second confluence. The threshold. Roads of trial. Temptation. Descent, atonement, aka facing the father in journey when you are meditating, you are facing your ancestor. The crossing, reclamation, this is when you are grabbing the boon. Nadir, this is when you are... Um, Nadir, when you are basically... You see that final scene in the mountain. Uh, journey... This horrible part, so hard, of the mountains, with the guardians. That's, you know, oh my god. I remember when I watched that scene, it was a friend playing uh, a let's play. I was just watching him stream. That scene. You want to believe so hard. And slowly you realize that your character failed and you are like, oh my god. No. You feel like shit. There's that big fade to white. The character has failed, the character is dead. What do you have just after? Uh, game. Um Oh, I won't have that cinematic. Um The composition of every scene is incredible. Uh Um, 
you have that scene with all the ancestors around you and your character gets resurrected the scarf is expanding and now you are dashing through the clouds and now you can fly uh Uh, journey game. You can fly at the end. This level. The magic flight. So you have the rescue from without and basically journey is basically an entire uh, uh, it, it's like um journey basically the twist of the story is that it's a cycle it's a cycle and i'm gonna go through that uh, i could never play journey by myself one day i would love to honestly i when I played it, it was less intense because I was too distracted by the gameplay. I'm more sensitive to it when I'm watching a Let's Play without any commentary. That's just m myself. Basically, there's the refusal to return because you, you cannot return. There's this uh, weather storm, this blizzard freezing you. Then there's the magic flight, rescue from without at the same time. Crossing of the return threshold. This is that scene at the end. This one. Final level is called Apotheosis, whatever. This is the end. You're almost there. By the way, you always, when you play with someone, you arrive that you always draw a heart in the snow. Before leaving. Always. You always need to draw a house in the snow before. Next. Crossing when you are entering the light. Master of two all, you have finished the game. And if you succeeded in finding all the secrets, you have the white cloak for the next run. And the tradition in the game is when you have the white cloak, you are becoming one of the ancient store. And if you are playing with someone with a red cloak, this is officious, but everyone in journey is doing that. When you're playing with the white cloak and you are playing with someone with a red cloak, your goal is to get them, is to show them all the secrets of the game for them to have a white cloak next time they play and for them to uh to um, to transfer the knowledge to someone else basically to pass the knowledge that's how you are a master of two worlds and freedom to live that's the final scene when you are returning back to the to the, um, to the beginning of the game And that's called Return with the Alexia. So you know all the secrets of the game and you can guide other people now. And that's how, in Journey, you start as a hero, you bond with other people so you develop the lover archetype. You are facing stuff, so even if you cannot fight, you are still... Keep going on, so you are developing the warrior archetype. And if... You pass the knowledge. If, if, if you play the game and if you discover the secret, you are the magician. And if you pass the knowledge, you also have the king archetypes within your character. And that's why Journey is so universal. It works so well. 
Because it's the purest form in a game of the modern myth. And that's why when you play Journey, everyone will experience the game in a different way. Because thanks to the modern myth and because it's so universal, you would be able to see whatever talks to you in your life. Isn't that incredible? At some point, we need to have a let's play of Journey. We need to have a let's play of Journey and Abzu. Abzu, that's the same. We need to play the Pathless. I've not played it. I'm gonna play Journey and Abzu for my birthday, I guess. I'm gonna stream them and explain them uh, in real time. Abzu is incredible. I'm terrified of deep water because I'd almost drowned when I was a kid. I'm terrified of deep water, but I, I loved Abzu so much. I loved it so much. And I just want to end on uh, this picture of the hero's journey. Let me copy the picture. I'm going to paste it in Photoshop. Abzu is so cool. Uh, I need to play Kena, but then I'm not totally convinced by it. It's very beautiful. No problem about that. I'm not very convinced by it. All right, we're going to do a screen capture. Here we go. So, and you see in Journey, or in any game, you start there, and it's a, it's a cycle, it's a circle, call to adventure, you have the mentor, you are basically crossing the threshold and potentially killing the guardian. That's why in Journey, the enemies are called the guardians. Because they are guarding you from accessing the spiritual world, which is the unknown world. The known world is the physical world. The unknown world is the spiritual, magical world. Child of Light is so great. It's so great. The music is incredible too. So you are crossing the threshold between the known world and the unknown you have the mentor, you have the transformation, the challenges and temptations. Then you are eating rock bottom. This is why in a good story, at some point, a character needs to hit rock bottom. To feel that he has lost everything. In order for him to get back and to get the rebirth and transform. And then a turn... Facing the father figure, then returning to the real world with the knowledge and the gift of the goddess. Let's get back to the, the charts. Remember that at some point we have a magical item with the supernatural aid. For Harry Potter, this might be the wand. The, the, the magic wand when the, the one chooses him. Let's do Star Wars. Call to Adventure. Luke Skywalker is a simple guy in Tatooine. Obi-Wan is Star... It's been a while since I've seen Star Wars, so bear with me. Obi-Wan is starting to approach Luke, but Luke doesn't want to admit that. Supernatural aid, the magical item, it's not the ring. It's a lightsaber. Crossing the first threshold, that's when he's manifesting the force for the first time. Belly of the whale, that's when he's that's when he realized that he's not a random guy. He is a future Jedi. He's probably the last. At least in theory, the last Jedi. Roads of Trial, that's when he's um meeting um all of his buddies, training Vyoda and stuff like that. 
meeting with the goddess. In that case, I would say that meeting with the goddess and temptation would be when he is uh, meeting Princess Layla. Atonement with the father is literally facing Darth Vader, which is his father. Hypophysis. Greater understanding is achieved. Armed with this new knowledge and perception, the hero is resolved and ready for the more difficult part of the adventure. That's when he realizes that he is from a legacy of Jedi's. And the very powerful ones. Ultimate boon. This is basically when... Uh, atonement with the father might also be when he is meeting Yoda, to be honest. For Fius is when he is realizing that indeed he has a lot of force. It's like the do it or don't do it. Ultimate boon comes back with the force. Refusal of the return. That's when Darth Vader is saying, I am your father. No! Magic flight. We don't have magic flight, but we have spaceships. Rescue from without is gaining health. Especially from Darth Vader. Crossing of the return threshold is going back to normal. Master of Two World is becoming basically the next last Jedi mentor. Freedom to live is living a simple life. Now that Darth Vader is defeated, the Emperor is fury defeated. Until Ray comes and wreaks havoc. See the idea? That's why at some point a character needs to reach rock bottom. For it to transform. The transformation of Luke is twofold. First of all, from a normal guy to, um, to a Jedi. And then to a Jedi to Darth Vader son. To back to a Jedi. And basically... In any case, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, whatever, there is already two objectives at the same time. The first one is the one until Apotheosis. And then that's when they realize they need to fight for something greater than them. Harry Potter just wants to discover magic. Frodo just wants to bring the ring to Rivendell. He doesn't even want that. And uh, Luke just wants to be a farmer in Tatooine. Then they realize they have a greater mission. Frodo needs to destroy the ring. It's greater than him. Harry Potter needs to steal the fields of Earth and kill Voldemort. That's greater than him. Um, Luke Skywalker needs to realize that he needs to be the chosen one and to bring back balance in the Force. That's why you realize that the initial fight is not the one that you want. So if you want to write an interesting character, you want to make him fail at the first objective. That's when the character is eating the nadir, the rock bottom, and transforms. He realizes, the character realizes that the first objective was not the good one. It was leading to a dead end. And that's when the character is going from a hero to a warrior, basically. Make sense? Is that a bit clearer now? <laughs> I know there was a lot of stuff today. This is not, this is not really art related. This is over culture related. But this is so important because you can also ask yourself at which stage of the hero's journey my character that I'm designing is. During the atonement, he's vulnerable and once he succeeds, he's strong. And the transformation is about to die. And the challenge is he's stressed. At the threshold, he's worried and scared. Before that, he's safe. He's calm. When he's in the known one, your character is calm and chill. All right. I'm going to end the stream. I'm going to redraw for like one hour. Thanks all for coming, guys. As always. For those watching on YouTube, feel free to drop a like, drop some comments, to subscribe on YouTube, join us on Twitch, this way you can interact with us together, you can play some games, you can ask some questions. 
if you want to support me financially, you can also subscribe on Twitch with access to nice emotes and stuff like that. You can make a donation if you want. If you want to support the stream in a non-financial way, just recommend the stream and the content and the community of the Discord to people you know would benefit from that. And also join our Discord. We are building lots of great artists. Next week, we're going to have some accountability and some group session to get things done basically if you want to join you can anyways have a nice evening have a nice weekend guys for those who are watching the stream right now stay tuned i'm just relaunching the stream in like 10 seconds i'm gonna grab some food so i'm gonna just play a song between uh, while the, the stream is starting. I'm going to draw for like one hour again. For the other ones watching on YouTube. Have a nice day. Afternoon or evening. And take care.